whatever you have for us, that, Father, our minds would be open to you, that, Father, you would speak to us, speak to us as a father to his children, to guide us and direct us, Father, to give us encouragement. And Father, I pray for every person in this room. I pray for those that are watching on the live stream, that, Father, this could be a time of, of receiving now, of your word, that we could surrender ourselves over to you, and that, Father, you could speak to us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Wow, what a, what a time. Amen. I always get really nervous most of the time. We have such an amazing praise and worship, and my fear is that one day I'm going to get up here and mess all that up. Amen. But it's been a great, great time. Uh, who's doing our children? Oh, there they are. Miss Melanie. There you are. Miss Melanie's coming up. And so any of our kids up to sixth grade, if you want to come now, these ladies are here to uh, take you on up to Children's Church. Y'all have a great time. Uh, this is all of our kids up to sixth grade. Now, if we have any that's kindergarten or under that came in late, parents, I'll, I'll remind you again at the end of our service that you'll pick them up today here at the preschool area as you go out the door here on the south side. Our other kids will all be picked up in the fellowship hall as normal. Wow, good group. Man, I love, I love, I love this. It's good to have this many here. Amen. Today, we're going to look at connecting to God. That's what I've been preaching now for basically the entire year, is just connecting to serve. That's been the title of the series. We've talked about connecting to God, how that's the relationship we have to have with Him. But that's the most important thing that we're ever going to get to be a part of is our relationship to him. Then we talked about connecting to the church, the local body to, to minister through the church, to also be ministered to through the church. And then we last, last several weeks, we've been talking about connecting to people, that we need to be focused on people, not on stuff. And so often, even in the church, we can get so focused on stuff, we forget about the people. Well, today I want to begin to a section now on serve. On serving, we're, we're connecting to serve, connecting to God, connecting to the church, connecting to people for the purpose to serve. And that's what I want to look at today. I want you to take your Bibles and turn to the book of Joshua chapter 24. We're going to be looking at the, basically the end of Joshua's leadership. Now, just to re, re go, redo what uh, Joshua is all about, you remember Joshua is the leader. He took over. When Moses said his time was up and that he was going to die, Joshua stepped in as the leader. Now, Joshua was not only serving God at that time, but if you'll remember, Joshua was one of the 12 that many, many years prior to that, Moses, as the nation of Israel, the children of Israel were about ready to go into the promised land. He sent 12 spies over there to go look. Joshua was one of those. So when Joshua and the 11 others went over, they came back and they spent a lot of time there. They came back and they gave an amazing report about what they saw over there. And they said, man, surely this is a land that's flowing with milk and honey. And it is everything that God said it would be. But when it came time for them to give that report, they said that. But then 10 of them said a word that basically negates everything that they felt about God, and that, that was the word but. They said, man, that land is amazing. That land is everything that, that God said it would be. It does flow with milk and honey. It will meet all of our needs, but, but the cities are amazingly fortified. The people are huge, and as a matter of fact, there's some that we look very small. We look like ants compared to them, so we don't think we're going to do it. Well, now Joshua he and Caleb, a man named Caleb, if you'll remember, they said the same thing about the land. They said, yes, this is an amazing land. It's got everything we need. And instead of saying the word, but, they said, and we need to go. We need to know that God has delivered us that land. All we have to do is go get it. It's there for the taking. Now, of course, if you'll know the story that all the people followed the, the, the ten, Joshua and Caleb were kind of left out. But from that point on, Joshua became a leader 
to, to, to help along with Moses. And, if, and I preached a sermon a few weeks ago that Joshua was the leader of the armies. And Joshua was one that was fighting the battle. And remember when Moses had to keep his hands in the air, Joshua was the one doing it. When Moses passes away, Joshua assumes the leadership position. He now has led them into the promised land. They have taken over everything. They've now settled in and things are about to go good for them. And Joshua is an old, old man now. He's been serving God for many, many years. And this is basically his last address to the nation of Israel. And so what he's going to do in this address is he's going to challenge them or, if you will, encourage them to do something amazing. And that is to serve. To serve, and that's what bring, that's where we are at this point. He is now in the in chapter twenty four, been talking about all the great things God has done for them, and all the all the things that they have witnessed and seen. And now he comes to the text of uh, verses fourteen and fifteen, to where he's now going to lay it out before them. So, if you have your Bibles there, would you and you are able to, would you please stand with us and you at home join us as we read chapter twenty four starting at verse 14, and we'll just be reading verse 15. The Bible says here, Now therefore fear the Lord, and here it is, serve. Fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the river, and in Egypt serve the Lord. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods Uh, uh, which your father served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you now dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Father, thank you for this time of worship that we've already experienced. And now, Lord, as we step into your word, I pray that, uh, that God, you'd continue to just allow your presence to be felt here, and God, you would speak to our hearts and minds, direct us, encourage us, and guide us. And Father, I pray at the end of this time, when it's time for us to respond to all that you've done here in this service today, I pray, Father, that you will be able to be satisfied with what we, how we respond and what we choose to do. So Father, just continue to speak through me now. Let these words that I'm about to speak be your words. Let the message be your message. And again, the response be as you desire for it to be from your people. And Father, we'll give you praise for it all. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Now, as we're seeing here, Joshua has issued them to them a choice. And he says, serve. Serve the Lord. He said, if it seems right to you, you have a choice to do it. So what I want to look at today is the idea of serving. The the serving is, is where we now, with all that I've been talking about for this whole year of connecting, now it's time for us to, if you will, get where the rubber meets the road. It's now time for us to serve God. We've connected, or we should have connected, or you've been encouraged to connect. Now it's time to do something as a result of the connection. So serving, what is serving? Well, serving is nothing more than performing the will of God by obeying his command. In other words, just doing what God wants us to do. Now, Jesus addressed this same topic in the New Testament. He he basically asked the question, he said, Why do you call me Lord? Why do you say Lord, Lord, but yet you don't do what I ask you to do? Because serving God is nothing more than just doing what he said. So that's what serving is. If we're in a restaurant or we're anywhere else and we're serving people, what we're doing is we're hopefully giving them what it is they've ordered and and we're, we're serving them. We're giving it to them. So now God is leading us and God is calling us to serve him and he's telling us where he wants us to go, how he wants us to do it, and he's leading our lives. Now it is time for us to say we're going to serve God. In other words, I'm going to do what it is God asked me to do. It's really simple. Now we look here and we see then that that Joshua, as I said earlier, had been serving God since he was a young man. So this time of decision here was not that Joshua had gone through all this and said, okay, now I'm going to tell you, I at this very moment 
am going to serve the Lord. My household will serve the Lord. He had already been doing it. He was just making the declaration. So when we look at this serving, again, performing the will of God by obeying his command, what does it mean? Well, first of all, it means to do what he says in a way that makes him look important to us. That we respond to God in a way that people around us realize God's important to us. He's not an afterthought. He's not that I will serve God if I have enough time in my day or enough time in my week or if I'm not too busy or if something better hasn't come up, then I'll go ahead and serve God. When I serve God like Joshua is calling for the the Israelites to serve and what I believe God is calling the church today to serve, it is not as an afterthought, it is a forethought. That I will surrender to God regardless of what's going on in my life. As a matter of fact, the Bible says here in Matthew uh, 6, 33, it says, but seek first. Not seek after, not, not to exhaust everything that you can possibly do and the, all the ways that you can work it out yourself. But when you finally come to a point that you realize it's not working, okay, then come seek God. Well, now, before I, before I move on, if you are one of those people that have done that, and you're sitting there going, well, I've done that. Oh, my gosh. Does that mean God doesn't want me to serve him now? No, God still wants you to seek him. He was just hoping you would have done it as a first resort rather than the last resort. But he tells us to seek God first. Not when I'm ready. Not when I have time. Not when it's convenient. Not when there's nothing better to do. Not when I've exhausted everything else. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then all these other things, they will be added to you. So he says, I want you to seek God first and let the people around you, especially those in your family, let them see that God's important to you. Not that he's just, well, I don't have time for God today. I don't have time for the worship today. I don't have time for Bible study today. I don't have, I got so much going on, Pastor. You don't know my life. It's busy. I just don't have time. Joshua said, serve. Serve God like he's important to you and and important to your family. Again, not as an afterthought, but as a forethought. The second thing it means is it means to submit to him in a way that makes him look amazing. In other words, that you walk around and you start talking about how good God is. Amen. Folks, can I tell you, we need to, as God's people, as the church, you and I, we we really need to be bragging on God. We just sang in the very first song of 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 our praise and worship, God, there's nothing better than you. So listen to me, if there's nothing better than God, then we ought to be excited and let people know around us that God is amazing. In other words, we ought to brag on God. How often do we brag on him? How often do we say how good he is? God has done this for me. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us in Psalm 68, it says, Oh God, you are more awesome than your holy places. In other words, God is more awesome than heaven. As a matter of fact, I don't want to be in heaven if God's not there. Because he's what makes heaven awesome. Amen? God makes heaven awesome. Do you understand that God is more awesome than this worship service we just had? He's more awesome than First Baptist West. I know that's hard to believe, but he is. He's more awesome than our church. Because our church isn't anything apart from God. I don't want to be a part of this church if God's not here. Because he's what makes this church good. So he says, God, you are more awesome than your holy places. And he says, the God of Israel is he who gives strength and power to his people. Boy, God's good to us. Amen. And we need to brag on God. We need to let people know when God has done something amazing for us. Because how are they going to know how awesome? Listen, if God's not awesome to us, he's not going to be awesome to anybody else. Because they don't even know him. We know him. And God is an amazing God. And God, he needs to be bragged on. As a matter of fact, I I shared this in the first service. And I want to share it with you now. Because if I'm going to talk to you about, hey, bragging on God, then guess what I need to do today? 
If God's done something amazing, I need to brag on him. So I'm going to brag on God for just a minute. This Friday, y'all, if y'all remember, uh, my daughter Sherry, she, uh, she uh, was here just a couple of weeks ago. Well, Sherry came home. She serves in Prague, the Czech Republic. Been there for a, a little over a year now. Well, she got, praise God, she got to come home. Whew. Well, guess what? Friday, Friday, we had to put her back on the plane and we sent her back to Prague. Now, that was difficult. That was a, that was a, you know, one thing I found out, I don't care how old our kids get, sending them on a plane around the world is not easy. That's a grown woman. But it was tough. So anyway, I'll quit complaining. I'll tell you how good God is. We, got, we dropped Sherry off at the airport. We got to Stephanie's apartment to drop her off at the apartment before we came home. And that's about 10, 15 minutes from the airport. Well, we get a call, and it's Sherry. And man, I know this can't be good because she's not calling us to say, hey, I love you. It was so good being home, and I've missed y'all, blah, blah, blah. I know that wasn't going to happen. So Sherry calls, and we go, uh-oh. So we answer the phone, and we're, it's in, through the car so we can all hear, and we can all talk to her. And I said, hey, babe, what's up? She said, Dad, I don't know. This is not, may not be good. And I said, what's wrong? She said, the flight that I'm supposed to be on to get me to Houston to catch my flight to Germany, they've now told us that flight's going to be two hours late. And there's not another flight that that I can get on. As a matter of fact, she said, Dad, what worries me is that the flight I'm on from Houston to Germany is the last flight of the day. And if I don't make that connection and I didn't have a, much time to get from my, from my plane to the plane going to, to, to uh, Germany, I'm going to be stuck. Now you think, okay, well, that's not a big deal because she could spend the night in the airport, take the first flight out. Well, the problem here is she's now also on a time crunch because as you know, to travel from anywhere from here in the United States to anywhere in the world, you have to have a covid test and that covid test can only be administered so many hours before you leave they can't it can't be you can't go take a test one week and it be negative and so you're good that you can go anytime you want it's got to be within a time frame well the time frame unfortunately doesn't really allow much leeway time So it's not that we slacked off. We got it the moment we could get it, but it was going to be due. And and by Saturday morning, if she didn't get into the air before Saturday morning, her time was going to run out on the shot. I mean, on the uh, the test. So she'd have to now wait until the, the week, get her test, do the results, and try it all again. She wasn't going. So she said, Dad, I don't know what to do, but I got to go talk to somebody right now, so I'll, I'll call you back. So when she hung up, I, 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 Martha and Stephanie were still in the car with me. And, and I said, hey, hey, girls, let's pray real quick. Let's pray for Sherry. And I, we, I began to pray, Lord, you know the struggle. You know what's going on. And God, I'm going to pray that you will do something amazing, that you will open up a flight for her, or at least get that plane there on time. And then, God, I'm going to pray that you will take every barrier away from her for the rest of this trip. You make this, please make this a smooth trip for her. So we finish the prayer and Stephanie gets out of the car. I get out of the car and, and I'm walking around to the front of the car to talk to her for just a moment, hug her and tell her bye and let her go into her apartment. All of a sudden on my, my phone's in the car. I get a, another call on my, I'm, I'm looking and my watch is buzzing because it, and I look down at Sherry. So I said, okay, we got to get back in the car, find out what's going on. So I answered the phone and said, hey, babe, what's up? She said, dad, you won't believe what just happened. She said, there is an opening on the very next flight to Houston. And not only that, dad, it's first class. I said, "Woo, yeah, give Gord, brag on God, amen. And she said, and, not, and, and, and that I'm going to, not only am I going to not be rushed, said, Dad, this flight's leaving now. Instead of being there for right on time, I'm going to be there almost an hour and a half to two hours prior to my flight leaving for Germany. So we said, oh, praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Now, listen, I know that God did that for her, but he did it as much for Martha and myself. Because, listen, as I just said, it's kind of hard to send your, your daughter by herself around the world. 
And we were struggling because we missed her. And man, it was great having her home for that week. But it was God confirming to my wife and I, not only that, he, that the things were going to work out, but he said to us, I've got her. She's okay. Now listen, folks, as a parent, you need that sometimes. Amen. You need God confirming that everything is going to be okay. And so what was so cool is she texted us when she landed in Germany, and she said, Dad, I had no problems going through customs. It was as it's fastest that I've ever been through them. She said, I was there, and within five minutes, they checked me through, and everything was perfect. She said, I've never had it so smooth. I said, thank you, Lord. But hey, now listen, before you get the wrong idea, can I tell you that even had that not worked out, I still know God, I could have bragged on God because he was going to get her to Germany and then he was going to get her to Prague. But I just wanted you to know, if we're going to tell people how amazing God is, we need to brag on him just a little bit. Amen? Because that wasn't me that got my daughter over there. Man, that was God. He heard my prayer and I believe he confirmed what we were supposed to be doing. And he said, hey, I've got her. You don't worry about her. So we need to brag on God. He is an amazing God. And he says, he says, God, you're more awesome than all your holy places because you are that good. And he's not a burden. And so we need to be talking to people about his goodness and even in the middle of struggles. But you know what I believe? If sometimes, and, and I do this as, as much as anybody, instead of bragging on God, I want to tell people how tough I have it as a Christian. As a matter of fact, if I'm not careful, sometimes I walk around, nobody knows the troubles I've seen, nobody knows my sorrow. And that's how we portray God a lot of times. Even when things are good, oh, I suffer for Jesus. Oh, I'm this and I'm that. My friends, can we not serve God by just bragging on him? Because we serve an awesome God. But the thing is, and i got to hurry, the thing is, we must all choose. Second part of this sermon is Joshua tells the people, you got a choice. Joshua is standing before these people, and he declares to them the marvelous works of God, and then he challenges them to choose this day whom they were going to serve. Recognizing that God had been so good to him and to his people, he said, I want you to know, and if you look back in chapter 24, all of chapter 24, he's bragging on how good God treated them. All the great things that they did, even when they were not faithful, even when they didn't want to go over in the first time. But he's telling them. And what he was saying to them is, God has given man the power, and the capacity of choice. It wasn't that God looked out there and he told Joshua, tell the folks, you over here that are chosen, you're going to be all right. I, I'm, I've worked everything out. But now you over here that I haven't chosen, you don't have a choice. He said, you're, you are what you are. You're lost if you're lost. You're, you're going to stay where you are if you're going to stay where you are because I've chosen. He said, God has placed before you the ability and the capacity to choose. And he says, choose you today whom it is that you're going to serve. It's a choice that we have to make, amen? It, it's not a choice that God has to make because can I tell you, God has already made the choice, amen? Amen. Listen to this in, Rev in Ephesians 1, 4 it says, just as he chose us. So that's why I'm saying God doesn't have to make a choice to us, for us, because he's already chosen. Do you realize God's chosen all of you? God's chosen you at home. He's chosen me. Even when I was yet a sinner, he chose to die for me. He didn't make me become a good boy before I, he died for me. He didn't make me jump through a whole lot of hoops before he chose me. He didn't make me climb any mountains or anything like that. He chose me when I was at my worst. He chose me. That when I was a sinner, Christ chose to die for me. So listen, that's why he says, church, everyone here, everyone watching, it is your choice to make, not God's. He's already made his. Now it's up to you. You have to choose. You have to be the one. And he says, before the foundations of the world, we should be holy and without blame before him in love. He chose me and he chose you. So that's why he says, you though now have the capacity to choose. And Joshua knew that 
to declare loyalty was easy, but to maintain it would be very difficult. And that's why we always say it's easy to stand up and out here today say, Woo, okay, I'm excited. We had a great worship service. I choose to serve God. Okay, now that's easy. The hard part is when you go out from here and you hit the real world. That's when it gets difficult. It's when things, the music not being played well. It's when things in life are tough. Then it gets a little more difficult to choose. So what he did, a couple things here. He gave them encouragement since he couldn't make them do it. Remember a few weeks ago, I shared with you that the apostle Paul wrote that if I could be accursed so that you could be saved, I would do it. I would give up my salvation for you, but I can't do that. So he says, I'm just going to encourage you. So today... All I can do is stand up here on this, on this podium and encourage you to serve God. I can encourage you to turn your life to Christ. I can't make you do it. And God won't make us do it. That's why he says, you choose today. So you at home, same thing. I can't make anyone at home choose. But God has given us that capacity, and he gave them encouragement. But second, he gave them options. He says, serve idols or serve God. That's your choice. You don't have anything in between. You either serve the false gods, and we talked about those last week. You talk about the false gods, or you talk about and you choose the true God. He said, that's your choice. I, I'm laying out the option for you, but that, that's all you got to choose. And then the third one, he lays out the decision before them. He says, choose you today whom you're going to serve. And it's a, a definite contrast. And as a matter of fact, it's not even close. The choice that he wants us to make today, if we're going to serve God or want to serve the world, he said, look, it's not like they're really blending together and they look so much alike that you get confused. He said, there's a huge contrast. As a matter of fact, in the book of Deuteronomy, uh, chapter 30, verse 19, he says that I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you that I have set before you. Now listen, here's the choice. He said, I have set before you life and death. Hey, folks, can I tell you there's not a bigger contrast between the choice? Life and death. They're not anywhere close. It's life or death. Then he goes on and says, before you life and death, but also blessings and cursings. Not close. So he says, I'm, I'm now sitting here before you telling you, here's your choices. They're not, a, they're not close. You don't have to worry about it. And if you're even, listen, here's the cool thing. He says, even if you're confused about the difference between life and death, blessing or cursing, I'm going to tell you the right answer. Choose life. That's the right one. So God is telling us, you got to serve God or idols. Serve God. You got a choice between life and death. Sir, choose life. And you say, well, that's duh. Who wouldn't choose that? How about a whole lost world? Can I tell you God has placed before the world life or death? Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and what? The life. Then right here. Choose life. Choose Jesus. But can I tell you, there's a whole lot of people today that are choosing death. A lot of people. There are a lot of people who call themselves Christians who are choosing cursings over blessings. Turning to the world and wanting the world to satisfy them. I choose the stuff of this world. That's why he says, store not for, up for yourselves these things of the earth. But store up for yourself treasures in heaven. There's the choice. But he says, you know what? You got to be the one to make it. So he says, choose life. That you and both you and your descendants may live. So Joshua declares that out there for them. And we must choose. And last, I want to wrap it up here. I wanted to wrap up to another important part here about the household. Joshua says something here that's, that's really cool if you think about it. He didn't say, I choose the Lord. I choose to serve the Lord. What he did was he said, I choose that 
me and my household, we, not I, we will serve the Lord. So he chose for his household. So we just realized, though, that I can't make someone do it. Then how do I choose for a household? Well, it's this way. First of all, he showed them our, show them our service to God. So if I want my household to serve God, guess what I must be doing? I must be showing them my service. My kids must see me serving God. My wife, my daughters must have seen my wife serving God. Not complaining, not whining, not talking about all the bad stuff that's happened to us because we've sacrificed so much for God, but that we brag on God. We continue to call on God. When things get difficult, we don't fold it up, but we stay with Him. Show your family that God's important to you. That's how you choose for your household. Choose that it's important to you. Joshua had shown his unwavering loyalty to God long before he became a leader. Now, he wasn't perfect. But folks, he did serve God. And he served it out in the open. But the second one is to teach and expect their service. Teach our kids to serve. Teach them to serve with gladness. Teach them to see the miracles of God. I found this quote and and this is, this is, I believe, part of the problem. He says, those that have been privileged to see the work of God usually may remain true. So when God has done some amazing stuff in my life, and he's done some amazing stuff in your life or whoever's life he's done some amazing stuff in, a lot of times, man, those people will stick with it because, man, they realize, they know. They have seen it. They have experienced. He said, but the problem is, it's the next generation that somehow fails to adequately communicate to the next generation of the marvelous things of God. In other words, we maybe have had God experience in our lives, we may have experienced him well. But because we love our kids so much and we want them to be taken care of, a lot of times I'm afraid that what our kids see as miracles, they see miracles of mom and dad, not miracles of God that they see us doing it for them rather than God doing it for them. And we manipulate. As a matter of fact, I heard somebody once say that the trouble we're seeing in, in society today is that parents aren't preparing their kids for the road. They're trying to prepare the road for the kids to make it smooth, as smooth as they can get it. Folks, listen, if we make everything smooth for them, they trust us, but they don't have to trust God. They, they never see God. So what happens is we fail to talk about the marvelous works of God because we then become the miracle workers for our kids. How do we choose for our household? We teach and expect their service as well because we want them to experience God's miracles. So how do we choose it? Individually, we say, here I am, God. I choose you. I serve you. And then we say, but I'm also going to teach it to my, my household. I'm going to teach it and expect my family, expect them to follow my example. My prayers, I wrap this up, is God, please never prosper me above my capacity to maintain my love for you. Don't let me forget how good you are. So often in the Bible, it tells us to not when things are bad to remember God, but it's when things are good, don't forget God. So God, never let me prosper so much beyond where I realize you're the miracle worker. How marvelous you are. But as for me and my house, we're going to do what God wants when he wants it to the best of our ability. I'm going to ask the praise team to come on up now as we close this out this morning.
I want you to think about this as they're coming. First and foremost, do you here, do you at home, has there been a point in your life that you said, God, I know that I need you, and I know that I'm lost. Without you, I have no hope. I'm feeling hopeless today. So God, I want you to forgive me of my sin, come into my heart and save me. My friends, you need that more than you need anything else. That's what God's will is. That's what God's desire is for all men, all women, all boys, all girls to be saved. That's his will. To serve God, you got to do what he wants, and he wants us to be saved. So if you're here, you're at home, and you don't know Christ as your Savior, then you're not serving God. You're serving yourself. You're serving the world. Because you're trusting in you or you're trusting in your goodness or, or the things of this world to get you through. But today I want to tell you, it's only God. It's the marvelous works of God. But if you're here and you say, Pastor, I know I'm saved. But my question is then, are you serving? You're, you say you're connected, but are you serving? And that serving is doing what God wants you to do. Is there something in your life right now that you know God is wanting you to turn over to him or that God is wanting you to do, but you just can't seem to let go? What is it that's more important than God? What is it that's more marvelous in this world than God? What is it? Then I, if you've got an answer there, then I pray that God would allow you to seek him first above all things. Man, it's got to be him. Not him, but. Not him and, not him or. It's him. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if, if you're here today and you're at home, if you're here and you need Jesus, man, I just, wanna, I just wanted to ask you, to, would you pray to receive him into your heart this morning? If you're here and you know you have Jesus, but you say, God, I know that I've been focused on other things before you. But today, God, I want, to, I want you to be first. I seek you now. I want, I want to serve you. I want people to know how good you are. I want people to know what you've done for me. Let me seek you now first. The altars will be open. You at home, if you want to call the church, man, someone be listening there. Someone be ready to listen. Someone be ready to pray with you. Whatever it is, would you come? Oh, how good God is today. Who will you serve? To whom will you give your allegiance? Father, hear our prayer this morning. As we step into this invitation time, I pray again that you will be pleased with the response of what's happening here today. In Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask you to stand.